God, you came from an Arab country, you are Jewish, you can tell us what is to be a Jew in an Arab country yes. and now. So I was born in uh, Lebanon, grew up there uh, for 11 years, and then when the Civil War started in 1975, we were there for the first year of the Civil War. And then it became very, very, very dangerous for us to be there as Jews, and so we had to leave on the threat of imminent execution, and so we emigrated to Canada. And so I'm very familiar with the realities of the Middle East. You became a very important person talking about science. Yes. Thank But you. what does it have to be to do science with Israel and the Arab conflict? So I, I've got two different passions. Of course, I've got my scientific passion. I apply biology and studying consumer behavior. But I'm also a strong supporter of freedom of speech. As somebody who came from the Middle East, who, where these freedoms are not natural, and then to move to Canada, to move to the West, where these freedoms until very recently were guaranteed, uh, I feel very strongly about the need to speak out uh, to try to protect that very fundamental Uh, freedom and regrettably what's happening today is that there is a increasing number of forces that are quelling freedom of speech people are afraid to speak their minds when it comes to uh, certain geopolitical realities let's say about Israel the Middle East or about certain religions and I think that's very dangerous but when you speak you said about freedom of speech we know that in the United States in Mexico in many countries we have freedom of speech so why we don't speak freely about religion, about some religions like the Judaism, about Muslims, right. why do we don't speak freely about them? Because even though legally speaking we're supposed to have freedom of speech, there are now forces, for example in the universities, where it is not politically correct to speak your mind. Uh, it's okay to criticize Israel, that means you're progressive, but you should never criticize Islam, that makes you hateful, racist. And so this type of viewpoint is becoming spread in intellectual circles and so people are afraid to speak their minds. So even though legally speaking you still have freedom of speak, speech, pragmatically people self-censor. They're afraid that if they speak their mind other people won't like them, their careers will be affected and so frankly we don't really have freedom of speech. But we have freedom of speech when, we, when it's time to criticize Israel. Yes. Everybody criticizes it like, is it? They do the bad. Also Jews, we criticize, we said it's correct to criticize Israel, it's correct to criticize the politics of Israel. Yes. Uh, you know, criticizing Israel in some cases is very justified, right? I mean, it's normal that any government makes mistakes and it's perfectly fine to criticize Israel. The problem is that many people now criticize Israel as a hidden way to actually be anti-Semitic, right? So it's not politically correct today to openly hate Jews in the West. But if you hate Israel, that's a way where you could still exercise your anti-Semitism under political correctness. And so it's a real problem. But also, we like Jews, we every time feel that if they criticize Israel, they are criticizing us. And so, for example, yesterday there was a caricature that made a car uh, draw where you see a perfectly ill uh, good kid and after that you see it with a bomb, uh, exploring a bomb uh, uh, back him and everyone says no it's about against Israel and when you see it it's not against Israel, it's against war. Why do we have to have that feeling that everything is against Israel or when it's against Israel we have to say it's against you? Yeah, so I think it's very very important to not always reflexively take a criticism of Israel and say that it is anti-Semitic because as I said There are things that Israel does that reasonable people could disagree about. So I think it's very important to say, look, I'm willing to criticize Israel when it does things that are against my morals. Uh, but to simply say, if you criticize Israel, it's equivalent to being anti-Semitic, no. But the reality is that on university campuses, many of the people who criticize Israel are really doing it because of their anti-Jewish hatred. You are an expert in, in consumption behavior. Yes. And you say about universities, why it's so useful and so good for people to sell the conflict and sell Israel as a bad thing. Why don't you sell it like a good thing? Right. Look, it's a battle of ideas. So in the same way that you market products and you market services, 
hear your marketing ideas. And the reality is that the enemies of freedom are much better propagandists than Israel. I mean, Israel might have a very strong military, but frankly, in the war of information, the other camp is winning. Because now when you go to any campus in Canada, in the US, in Western Europe, uh, there is really one voice that's the default voice, and it's the voice of anti-Israel. And so I think that it is really important for the Israeli government to not only have a very strong military, but to have a very strong informational warfare division. But when you are going to sell me a car, and you sell me a big car, a huge car, a marvelous car, or you are going to sell me a bad car that it's 20 years old, it doesn't work, I prefer to buy the new one. Yes. I prefer the good things. Why people prefer the bad guys like the Arabs, the ISIS, they, they, they believe that it's correct, the Palestinians. And when you say about Israel discovered that, Israel discovered the other thing. Israel made this a, a contribution to the world, to the world, to the... Yes. Yes. Why people prefer to so buy... There are several reasons for that. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. So it's a complicated answer. One is that uh, the leftists, a lot of the university professors are leftists and they have a hatred towards the West. And so it is normal for them to then get into bed with the Islamists because they have a joint hatred of the West. And so they romanticize the Arab world, right? The Arab world is the underdog. Israel is the evil conqueror. They're the colonizers. And that message, regrettably, resonates with a lot of people who don't have better information. So again, it's about good advertising. They're doing very good propaganda advertising. The other camp is not. But Israel and all the, around the, the world, the Jews have a very good advertisers. We have you, we have many big companies, we have many people in, in cinema, in the news. What do we have to do? Because nobody believes it. Yes. It's like no, no, nobody cares if we say this is good, Jews did that, they believe or they have to say that, or poor people, they suffer in the Holocaust. What do we have to do, like Jews, or not like Jews, like media, to make them understand that Israel and the Jews are not so bad. I mean, just participate in the informational war. I think a lot of my colleagues who are Jewish, who might privately agree with a lot of the positions that I take, will come to me privately and say, hey, we support you, you're doing a wonderful job, but are afraid to do so publicly because they're afraid about their, their careers, they're afraid about their social circles. So everybody who's in a position to participate in this informational war has to make their voices heard. You can't be too busy buying the tomatoes at night and getting your kids to school and worrying that somebody else is going to fight the fight for you. This is a very serious battle for freedom. And there are some forces now that are trying to quell those freedoms in the West. And we have to stand up and say, no, everybody is welcome here. It doesn't matter where you're from, as long as you support Western values. Tell me an example of what is your battle. How do you fight it? Because you say, a lot of colleges don't do it, or don't, they are afraid. What do you do that, that afraid them? What, why are they afraid? No, what do you do that they say, no, I, don't, I won't do that? What do we have to do that you do that you say it's... You have to engage in reason dialogue. Uh, look, reason and science and data will ultimately solve this debate. So for example, if you want to say, uh, which religion is most likely to have committed violent acts? Well, there is data that you can go, that you can gather, that can answer that question. So what you have to do basically is be armed with reason, with data, and hopefully then the arguments are going to be on your side. The problem is that people are so afraid to be called racist, Islamophobic, hateful, you're a Nazi, you're right wing. This is how you shut people down, right? If you're in the Middle East, they cut off your head. If you're in the West, they cut off your reputation. And so people are afraid. They don't want to lose their careers. They don't want their friends to hate them. And so they'd rather be quiet and have somebody else speak for their from them. And that's bad. Everybody has to speak. But in many countries, Jews prefer to be, I'm not going to say underground. Yes. They like to be, don't, don't be seen. Yes. They want to be like, we are here, but we are not going to defend Israel or we are not going to defend. We are going to do it. Passive. It's that correct or we have exactly. to be active. This, by the way, in the context of the Middle East, this is called dimmi psychology. A dimmi in Arabic is somebody in the Quran.
it says that people of the book, meaning Christians and Muslims, uh, meaning Christians and Jews, could live under Islamic rule as long as they live as second class citizens, actually third class citizens. They have to pay a jizya, a tax, so that they could be protected, but they live as dhimmis. And therefore, the, the psychology of the Jew in many cases is, as you said, be quiet, don't make too much noise, and hopefully people won't come looking for you. But the reality is, this is a war of ideas, so we can't be quiet. Everybody has to speak up with respect, without hatred, with reason, but everybody has to contribute to the debate. If you have to make a slogan to sell Israel or to sell the <laughs> Jewish, what will, will, will it be? To well, well, you just look at the Middle East and you look at which country in the Middle East supports religious minorities. Christians, Muslims, atheists. Which country has the best rights for women in the Middle East? Which country supports gays? Which country has the most uh, laws that are in line with Western values? Those are very easy questions to answer. So this is how you support Israel, by speaking truthfully. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't things that Israel does, as I said, wrongly. But if you look in the Middle East, its neighbors are a lot, a lot worse than Israel. So that's how you sell Israel. But people don't care about it. When you say about all of that, they answer you. Yes, but they are occupying the territories. They are killing the Arabs. They are killing yes. Palestine. That is not true. Not the correct truth. Of course not. So, but they, can, they buy that. You are the expert. How to change that? How to make them understand that that's the truth? We give this. We are the only democracy. And nobody. It's like yes, we are the only democracy. And they say yes, but you kill this. Yes. You kill the other. You fight. You are. It's very hard to do that. The, the best way to answer the specific point about you occupying land is any land that you can think of today, anywhere on Earth, had, was at one point occupied by somebody else. Okay. I live in Quebec. Quebec used to be, well, the, the native Canadians were Algonquin and Iroquois. Well, today they're no longer around, right? We're, now, if we're going to give back the land to the Palestinians, then we should also make sure to give back Quebec to the native Indians. We should give back areas of Southern California to Mexico, and we should go to every country around the world and redress past historical grievances. That's not how history works. There are injustices that happen. We used to live in Lebanon. We were kicked out of Lebanon. And now we've made a new life elsewhere. That doesn't mean that there aren't injustices in life, but you can't keep singing that song for generations because history is organic. It changes. It's time to accept the fact that Palestinians and Israelis and Jews are going to be in this land. Let's move on. But you are saying that we have to forget about occupied countries, the occupied territories that are for all people administrated and say it's already, it's part of this country, it's part of that, and forget about occupied, uh, occupied, because in the history they will become some part. Right. So you, you, you're saying that have a one-state solution, or you're saying that go no, ahead? I don't know. Which one do you think is the best solution? No, the, one, two, three, somebody said eight countries there. I don't I know. Mean, I mean, ideally it would be very nice to have a two-state solution. I think the problem is that, and maybe some people will disagree with me, I think the conflict in Israel is actually not one of land. The real conflict is a religious conflict. Uh, both the existence of Israel is based on religious narrative in Judaism, and then the, the fact that the other camp doesn't accept that Jews live on that land is also part of a religious narrative from Islam. And so as long as you're going to have Abrahamic religions that are very intolerant of one another, I don't think there will be peace in the Middle East. Curious what you say because we just heard from somebody else that it's a territory conflict just, it's not. and somebody else told us that it's, it's, not even, it's not even a religious co uh, conflict, it's an existentialist conflict, that they don't want ex that, people, that Jews will exist. Well, Is that not. correct? Well, so, that's, that's, a, that's a religious argument, right? I mean, uh, the idea that a country that was dominated by Islam at one point should ever revert to someone else is not allowed by Allah. This is why Andalusa in Spain, a lot of the Islamists will say, we will inshallah conquer back Andalusa. Why? Because at one point, Andalusa was under Islamic control. Once something is given by Allah to Islam, it can never revert to others. And the reality is, Israel falls under that. So it is actually a religious argument. The Jews should not be there. And there is a million 
uh, clips that you could find on YouTube where Imams are saying this very openly in Arabic. It doesn't take much. You can take five minutes and you'll see that. So, I mean, yes, on the surface it's about territory, but the underlying causes are related to religion. And how to change that? That's the last question. <laughs> what do you do to change that? Because when we spoke about territory, when we speak about Israel, you say it's easy. Just say what is the biggest things. But when you're speaking about a conflict like this, how to change that in the whole world? Well, I, I think the solution is not going to be one that's ever going to be implemented. And I think it's basically for us to believe in a common humanity and let go of all of these religious divisions. Humans have an uncanny ability to divide themselves, right? Even within the Hasidic Jews, you can be this type of Hasidic and, and you never marry this type of Hasidic, right? If you're a Muslim, you could be a Shia, you could be a Sunni. If you're a Christian, there's a million denominations. So people have an uncanny ability to always view the world as us versus them. Get rid of that, recognize that we are all common humans, and hopefully that will solve the problem. That sounded like a... a John Lennon. No, no, like a Miss Universe contest uh, <laughs> answer. What do you think? What's your best? But that's really, that, that's why I think I'm, I'm pessimistic, because I don't think it's ever going to be solved, because as long as you're going to have people who are driven by their religious convictions, which is always going to be present in the Middle East, right? The Middle East is founded on tribal religious beliefs. If you're going to have that, you're always going to have problems. We are thinking about ideas, just to finish. What's your idea? What we can do? Support that and say it's all right. It's not going to happen anything that we have to live with that or we can't change it. What's your idea for Jews, for Israel. Israel and for all the world? Look, I think that from a Jewish perspective, I'm very Jewish in terms of my identity, but I'm not very religious, right? So in other words, I think that you could still hold on to your religious heritage, but, but reject some of the religious narratives that were passed down from several thousand years ago. I'm a man of science, so I can't really believe in all of the religious narratives. So I, so I introduce myself to people as an atheist Jew. How could you be an atheist and a Jew? Well, because Judaism has many elements. There's culture, there's a shared history, there's a, a shared uh, genes. There. So there are many elements to being Jewish beyond what's written in the Mosaic books. And so I think what we need to be is secularists. We need to disassociate governments from religion and hopefully that will create better peace in the world. We have a lot to talk about it. You give me another thing to talk about, about religious, secular, but we will do it another time. Thank you very much. And it was very interesting. Thank you. Cheers.